Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lewis Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program. I'm going to talk about energy this morning, particularly the energy crisis that I think will, uh, the world will be facing by the mid-century. At least that's what the opinion of some people is, that the world will be facing an energy crisis by the mid-century when the population reaches about 10 billion people. So I'm going to put some numbers here for you to give you some idea of what's going on. You see that uh, by the year 2050, people predict that the population of the Earth will be about uh, 10 billion people, and the power need will be between 10 and 30 terawatts of carbon-free power, of course. That's what we're interested in. And if we look at the resources that are available to us, which will give us so-called carbon-free power, Obviously, we eliminate all the first four of them because they're all pollutants. So we are really looking at uranium because nuclear energy is the answer to the so-called carbon-free power situation. And if we look at the uranium reserves in the world, it's about 60 to 300 terawatt years. So if you take that number and you divide it by that, you find that the uranium reserves will last about 10, dec I mean, 10 years or so. So we have to find a way to produce more fuel for, for reactors, for fission power particularly. But let's wait for that for a second. So we see right here, the nuclear power is going to be really the major component of this carbon-free power that the world will need. And since we will not have very much available just for mining, we have to do something about breeding fissile material. So you see right here, uh, we have to sort of breed fissile material by the, basically the, the uh, hybrid system that, uh, that I'll be talking about. In fact, this, this was observed by Sakharov and Beta, two Nobel laureates, that you really need to go that way. You have to breed fissile material. And they established the fact that the fusion-fission hybrid is the best way to, to do that. So we're going to talk about breeding some of that by this system that I'm going to describe. You can go one of two ways. You can go either using uranium-238 to produce plutonium-239, but from a proliferation point of view, that's not very desirable. We don't want to produce weapon-type material. So the best, next best thing is to go with the thorium cycle, namely using thorium-232 to produce uranium-233, which is a fissile material that is very um, relevant to these things that I'm going to be discussing. <clears throat> now, some people might argue that there are ways of uh, breeding fissile material by other means, such as fast reactors. And uh, one can make the argument that, in fact, let me see that, okay. One can make the argument that uh, at the price of so-called neutrons, so we need to use neutrons in order to breed fissile material. And uh, if you look at the price of neutrons, some people have already estimated that's easy to estimate. You can go to thermal reactors and indeed produce some uh, fissile material, but the, the bottom line is the so-called price per neutron. And if you see, I'll put some numbers. And the way you judge that is by the number of neutrons per MeV, MeV unit of energy. And in the case of the thermal neutrons, you see that the price, or if you can call it a price, 6 times 10 to the minus 3 neutrons per MeV. The other possibility is a fast reactor, which uh, probably improves a little bit to about 7.5 times 10 to the minus 3 neutrons per MeV. And then some like accelerator-driven system, which was initiated by Professor Rubio, who was a Nobel laureate in 1981 or 82, whereby he uses accelerators to produce neutrons. 
he will accelerate protons and hit a target, and by spallation, produce neutrons. And that, again, it takes about two GeVs of energy to produce 30 neutrons. And you see the number comes out to be something like this. Finally, we find out that the fusion is actually your best bet. It gives you about 5.7 times 10 to the minus 2 neutrons per MeV. So the argument goes in favor of fusion source of neutrons as opposed to the others. Now, we talk about the fusion, so let me digress a little bit because fusion is at the heart of the system that I'm going to describe. Uh, I'm sure most of you heard about fusion reactions or fusion energy as opposed to fission. And the popular reactions, fusion reactions, are the ones that you see up here. In other words, you can take deuterium and deuterium, and that reaction will give you tritium and a proton. The interesting one is this one right here, deuterium and tritium. The reason for that is that it's, it has the lowest ignition energy. In other words, to ignite it to become self-sustaining, <clears throat> it takes about this kind of a, an ignition temperature as opposed to the others which are higher. Now, why are we interested in uh, certainly fusion? Fusion power by itself, of course, is not yet available. As most of you know, there is an international activity in building what they call ITER, an international thermonuclear experimental reactor at Cadarache in France. And uh, the projection is that fusion, pure fusion power is not going to make an impact by the mid-century. So we really can't focus on that as such. However, it can play a role in the system that I'm going to describe. So in order to give you some background why we need that, let me just spend a few minutes here talking about fusion. For example, the ocean is full of deuterium. Just to give you an idea, there's, deuterium exists at the rate of about one particle for every 6,500 particles in the ocean. That doesn't sound very much. But if you take a gallon of water from the ocean and extract the deuterium out of it and burn it by this process, it will produce as much energy as 300 gallons of gasoline. So it's, it's a pretty impressive energy. <laughs> So uh, the, that's the reason why the world is really pursuing fusion power. But as I said, for our purposes, for the mid-century problem, that is not likely to make an impact. But let me again continue with that just to show you what the parameters are so that you can have a feel for it. There is a certain criterion that tells us how we can extract energy from a fusion reaction. In other words, what criteria should be satisfied in order to extract energy from a from a power reactor, a fusion power reactor. So if you take an element of volume, like a cubic centimeter in that reactor, and do some sort of an energy balance, I hate to bore you with, with algebra here, but basically what we're doing is we, we have a criterion, which we also, in order for the reactor to produce power, we must satisfy at least what, what we call the Lawson criterion. Now what that means is this, is that if you take the number density of one of the reactants, such as deuterium, multiply it by the number density of the second reactant, like tritium, and you multiply it by a reaction rate. Don't worry about that symbol, but that's basically a reaction rate. And the energy produced by that is that. And there's a quantity called time. So because this is power, you have to multiply by time to get energy. So we call that confinement time. And that's a very important parameter. In any case, this first part is an energy production per unit volume in that fusion reactor. But the, uh, the fusion plasma loses energy by radiation. One of them is Bremsstrahlung, and the other one is synchrotron radiation, because we put it in magnetic field. And we know from basic physics that the system will radiate, the plasma will radiate energy. So that's an energy loss. And on the right-hand side is the thermal energy. In other words, we have to heat the system to the temperatures that we're talking about. So when this left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side, you don't make any money, just a break-even. You, you get as much energy out of it as you put in. So that's no, no utility company would be interested in that. You have to have this exceeding that one. Okay? So in any case, for our purposes, you can go through this calculation and pick out the, and put in the proper temperatures and put in the, uh, the appropriate values of these, which are you know, available you know, tables and so on, you can do that. You can come up with a quantity called the Lawson criterion. 
which is a basically a product of density and confinement time. So that's, that's what I really wanted to put here for you. So again, you can see, you can put in these numbers. As I said, you can look them up in the tables, and this is the radiative power. You can do all of that. And at the end, you come up with this expression for the so-called confinement time. In other words, if I stick to the deuterium tritium fuel cycle, as I said there, uh, you can see we come up with this quantity, so-called n tau, the product of density and confinement time. And uh, if you take a density of like 10 to the 14, which is roughly like a vacuum compared to the density of air in this room, uh, you find that if this is the density of interest, then the confinement time is one second. That doesn't sound like, you know, uh, to you and me, it is a very sh short time, but for the for the so-called fusion plasma, that's an awfully long time. And if you happen to somehow increase the density of your reactants to about 10 to the 23, like solid state density, then the confinement time goes down to about nanoseconds. Now that makes the distinction for two types of fusion approaches. The first one, the one that went with the 1014, now that's basically the the n tau product, or the Lawson criterion, for a magnetically confined plasma. In other words, this fusion plasma, we can find it by means of magnetic fields. If we increase the density to that, then the, the confinement time is like a nanosecond, so that's inertially confined. You don't need an external force to hold it up. And that is basically the idea that, for example, the people are Livermore pursuing so-called laser fusion, where you initiate fusion energy by bombarding a fusion target with a laser beam or a particle beam. But for our purposes, okay, is that th this n tau is the one that we're gonna focus on a little bit in this hybrid reactor that I'll be describing for you. Now the question almost always arises, uh, what happened? We've been working on this thing for about 50 years, why can't we do it, okay? Well, it, it's, it's a tough one. You see the, the, the parameters that I'm talking about is 10 kilovolt temperature, something like basically the temperature in the sun, and a density of 10 to the 14, and confine it for one second. Those three th parameters have to be satisfied simultaneously. We've been able to do one or two by themselves, but the three together has been a tough, uh, a tough task. And that, that's really what's holding up the whole thing. And what is the problem? What the problem, uh, I mentioned here some examples. For example, in a magnetic fusion, and I'll show some uh, sort of schemes that look, give you some idea what they look like. Uh, we, can, we can do basically, um, one approach is what we call magnetic mirrors. That's, that's a, a picture of that. This is really a very simple device, it's just a cylinder and you wrap coils around it to generate magnetic field, and you make the field stronger at the ends that you do at the center, then that sort of provides a reasonable confinement for this fusion plasma. Remember the plasma here is charged particles, we do to, 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 to deuterium ions and, and electrons, that's what it is, and basic physics tells us those charged particles do sort of uh, circulate around magnetic field lines, and so in this case they bounce be, back and forth between the mirrors, that's why it's called a mirror, kicks them back and forth. And we're able to confine the plasma that way. And this is just a plot of what the magnetic field strength is. It's stronger at the mirror, weaker at the center, stronger here. The major problem with this was is the fact that it's leaky. You see, the particles that ride the middle lines, they'll scoot out. So there's a certain fraction of the plasma leaks out of the system and for a fusion, a pure fusion power, this, not, this is not a very favorable thing. In other words, if you do the, the energy balance for the system, the leakage will hurt you, okay? So that's one approach, namely the magnetic, so-called magnetic mirror. The other approach is that uh, a system called, uh, uh, it's called tokamak. And this is the, basically uh, the so-called device that is being uh, built in, in Katarash based on this tokamak device. Uh, 
Tokamak, by the way, is a Russian word for donut-shaped system or some such word. See? So this is the idea here. So you can either go by the open-ended system, the so-called mirror, or you can go with the closed-ended system, which is the tokamak. Now, in both instances, we still have not achieved our friend N tau equal to 10 to the 14 when the plasma temperature is 10 kilovolt. We have to satisfy all those three parameters simultaneously, okay? Now, the question is why, what, what happened? What happened is that the plasma is, is a misbehaving animal. It does not like to sit still. The reason we cannot satisfy that requirement is because of what we call plasma instabilities. The plasma is, you can think of it as just like jello. You try to hold it, it squirts between your hand, between your fingers. So it's, it does not behave very well. We need to have that plasma sit still there for the length of time that I described, at the density that I described, at the temperature, in order to allow these fusion reactions to take place and produce energy. And that is where have, you know, we have not really achieved that. There's all sorts of reasons why that is, and that's called so-called instabilities. Namely, the fact that the fact is that the plasma sort of dances around, misbehaves, it can't sit still too long. And, and as a result, it sort of squirts out of the confinement system. And so it defeats the very purpose that we're trying to achieve. So what we're focusing on research-wise, worldwide, is try to understand these instabilities and how to control them, how to suppress them, okay? There's a couple of types of instabilities. Let me briefly describe them for you. On the one hand, we call them macroscopic, meaning it covers the whole length of the plasma. And these are so-called MHD type of instabilities, namely a magnetohydrodynamic. What that means is that the plasma behaves much like a fluid, okay, but it is, it is a magnetized system. And any time you put a little perturbation in it, and nature is full of perturbations, they begin to dance around and become unstable. The whole system becomes unstable, so it's a macroscopic. So, and that, unfortunately, in the case of the mirror that I showed you earlier, that is driven, unfortunately, by the fact that the magnetic field has a sort of a hump in the middle. Strange as it may sound, but that's what it is. In other words, magnetic curvature of the kind, which we call it, you know, will be concave towards the plasma like that, seems to be unstable to these magnetohydrodynamic modes. So you have to do something about that, correct that magnetic curvature, which we have ways of doing. The other source of instability is what we call microscopic, which means it happens on a small scale. That is typically driven by, and not by magnetic curvature, but it's driven by the fact that you have density gradients. And you can't imagine something on this earth where you put in a, a gas or plasma and it doesn't have a density gradient. It has a maximum and it dies out at some point. So there's always a gradient. And nature is out to beat you. So anytime you have a density gradient or temperature gradient, that drives this other kind of instability, which we call microscopic or kinetic instabilities. What does that do? Well, if these instabilities happen, they happen on a short, wave, uh, on a short uh, wavelength scale. In other words, they don't cover the whole plasma, but certain regions of it. They begin to oscillate, and as a result of the oscillation, they try to diffuse or cross the magnetic field and escape. So it has the same devastating effect. So the whole world effort, basically, in the last maybe 40, 50 years, is an attempt to understand how do we deal with these plasma instabilities? How do we suppress them so that the plasma can sit there quiescent and produce energy? Okay, and that's where the situation lies. Now, for the purposes of my talk, for the case of the hybrid reactor, fortunately, we don't have to wait that long or follow that route too much, okay? And that's what I want to really spend most of the morning on that. Now, we talk about hybrid, by definition, it's a, it's a combination in this case of, in this case, fusion hybrid, which means a fusion mixed with fission, okay? In fact, Edward Teller, back in 1981, if I, yeah, here it is, back in 1981 suggested that the best way to take advantage of this inexhaustible source of energy, namely the fusion, is to simply, you can see, to, uh, to uh, 
the best way to take advantage of it is to construct a fusion-fission hybrid. Combining fission and fusion is a natural marriage. And I think he has something, he has something there that we should be looking at. So using this as a, as a background, a lot of people have recently started to look at this. Can we, can we create this kind of a system, a, a fusion hybrid system? In fact, the popular press nowadays has been talking about this ad infinitum. For example, and there's an article in the so-called, I forgot which one, which journal that is, technology journal, it says a nuclear hybrid. Okay, this kind of reactor could produce clean electricity and remove dangerous nuclear waste from the planet if it ever works. <laughs> I think it will work if we spend enough energy and time on it. First, let me show you something that the Livermore people are talking about, okay? Now this is, it sounds weird, looks like a beehive, a, a chamber that the uh, Livermore people are talking about in terms of what we call inertial fusion. This is, this is an example of inertial fusion systems. I mentioned earlier, magnetic fusion systems like the mirror or the tokamak. This is an example of the laser fusion. Now what do they do? What they do is basically bombard a little tiny target of a millimeter in size, which full of fusion material. They target it or they hit it or zap it with laser beams. And the Livermore people are suggesting that this will be what we call the fusion part of a hybrid reactor which to me is really outlandish for several reasons. One, they're talking about 192 beams that come in through these beam holes to hit a target in the center of the chamber. Now you ask, why do you need 192 beams? Well, the main reason for that, even though the target is really tiny, millimeter in size, you have to illuminate it uniformly. If you don't, then that particular target will undergo oscillations and instabilities like the ones I talked about before. But if you illuminate it uniformly, you can suppress that. And that's the reason for having to uh, put in 192 beams and, and, and the target is right in the center, okay? And what they're suggesting is we use this as a so-called fusion component of a hybrid reactor. Remember, hybrid reactor, we have to combine fusion and fission, and I'll come back to that in a little more detail in a second. But this is the so-called ch chamber that they're talking about where they bring in 192 beams to zap this target here to produce, to, to initiate the fusion reaction, thereby producing neutrons, and in principle take those neutrons out to some blanket that will surround that to initiate fission. Now, there's several things which I think are outlandish at this, and they're, they're going ahead and selling this. One is that 192 beams, can you imagine the, the, the optics? The complication of that is enormous. Secondly, once you zap that, uh, they are talking about for a fusion hybrid reactor that will produce power. I think they're talking about five, 500 megawatt of thermal power. What they're talking about is that they have to they have to pulse these lasers 15 times a second, 15 hertz. Now what they do today, it takes about three hours to pulse a, a laser beam. So you have to go from three hours to 15 per second to make a fusion hybrid reactor out of that. That's number one, which I think is out, really outlandish. Secondly, when you initiate a fusion reaction here and you get basically fusion products as well as the ablation material, you're gonna fill that up with gas. You have to empty that to accommodate 15 shots per second, and that's gonna to be tough, plus the fact that all of this gas is going to make all of these beams that come in diffuse. They will not be focused, so that's another problem. So when you add it all together, you find out that this approach, at least in my judgment, is really barking up the wrong tree. One is that you need all these beams to do that at the rep rate that they're, they're talking about. And by the way, they said we need for a hybrid reactor, we need three million of these per year. Okay, now if you figure out the cost, I think it costs roughly about, I don't know nowadays, they do make these pellets about, I don't know, maybe a dollar or so a piece. But you need 
three million of those at a very cheap way, at a very cheap price in order to make a reactor out of it. So without really going much further on that, I, I say that this approach is not really a very promising approach to this hybrid system that, that I, I'm, I'm hoping someday we will develop that. In fact, this is the, the, the proposed reactor system that they're talking about. It's an enormous thing. Remember, this is the chamber here, and you got all of these laser beams coming in in order to hit that target to produce neutrons and so on. So in any case, they, uh, uh, it is not, in my judgment, the, the best way to, to do it. And uh, let me show another picture here, because I mentioned fusion magnetic fusion, and here's a, a picture of, of that. Here you can see it's an enormous, an enormous system, very large, and it is toroidal, you can see, and, and the cross-section is like a D-shape for so-called stability purposes. Now, the main objection, in my judgment, to a building of a fusion hybrid reactor used in either the tokamak or this laser fusion is one, it is pulsed. I like steady state. I guess I'm old fashioned. I like steady state systems, okay? These are pulse systems, number one. Number two, if you go with this, the, the magnetic geometry is very complicated. You remember, you have to use the fusion component to produce neutrons, which you make them, which you make these neutrons go into a blanket, a surrounding blanket containing fertile material in order to breed fissile material and fission that fission or induce the fission reactions to produce power. These are complicated pulse systems that, in my judgment, are not really the best approach to that. My preference, as I said earlier, it's a, the so-called simple mirror because it's linear, cylindrically symmetric, much easier to work with, and it can operate in steady state. And the plasma behavior in it has been reasonably well understood. This device is really a, a, a magnetic mirror device which was built at the Marshall Space Flight Center in, in, in Huntsville, Alabama, at least at my suggestion. The idea is, this is basically the, 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 the coils. Uh, the idea there was to build a device in which we can put plasma heat it up and inject it from the end to produce thrust because it will have tremendous capabilities, propulsion capabilities in terms of thrust and specific impulse and other things. So there is a device, so-called the gas dynamic mirror, which exists at Marshall Space Flight Center, which one can use as the so-called fusion component of this hybrid reactor, okay? Now this, this device, is, uh, as I said, is very suitable because of the simplicity and the fact that it operates in steady state. Here's, for example, another device with just a sketch of it, which the Russians have built. You can see they call it the gas dynamic trap instead. And basically you have so-called mirrors at the end, and this is a test center where you can produce fusion reactions and produce neutrons. Now the Russians, they have just built, by the way, in, in Novosibirsk, in, in Siberia, and they are selling it as a neutron source, namely a source that will produce 14 MeV neutrons, which you need for even fusion reactors because materials testing under these conditions are not available with, the, with reactor neutrons. You really have to go to 14 MeV neutrons, so the Russians have built this, and as I said, try to sell it as a neutron source which, of course, you could also use for the hybrid reactor because that's the, that's the whole idea. All right, now let me get back to what I am suggesting or I'm talking about, and that is, as I said, the, here's the, the system geometry that I'm talking about, okay, for, for this hybrid reactor. Here's what it will look like, I guess, in a very simple picture. What we will have here will be a fusion component, which will be that, the middle part of the mirror machine that I was telling you about right there. And it will be surrounded by a blanket. And you see right there is the blanket. Now for our purposes, the blanket will be made out of thorium-232 because that fuel cycle is a very good one for 
producing, for breeding uranium-233, and for producing power. And moreover, it's proliferation resistant. In other words, it's, it's, it, it resists all sorts of clandestine things or whatever. You can't steal it and do something with it at all. If, if, if you do, you're in trouble. Okay, so it is proliferation resistant. It is very suitable for a hybrid reactor. And as a result, I'm trying to emphasize that at this point. So here's a cross section, basically, what I'm talking about. Here you will have this fusion plasma, which we get it ignited, okay, start producing neutrons. And those neutrons will escape the fusion part, go into the blanket, where they will undergo these reactions. You see, you get the, you have a thorium-232 right in here. We have what we call an N gamma reaction. And that N gamma reaction leads to thorium-233. That in turn will decay by beta decay in about 22 minutes to protactinium-233. And that in turn will decay by beta decay to uranium-233. So that's the, that's the cycle we use to produce this first fissile material, the U-233, which we hope where one, it will be bred in this blanket, and simultaneously those neutrons not only will breed that, but they will also induce fission reactions in it to produce power. So it has that double, double purpose. Now the reason I show the cycle in that form, it just, this is basically when you go through the calculation, it will tell you how long it will take for this system to reach steady state. As I said, I like to see it operate in steady state. But what you do is first you initiate the fusion reactions by pumping power into the plasma to ignite it. And then you can work out the algebra and find out how long would it take to reach steady state. And it, takes, it turns out it takes about four months to do that. In other words, you have the system sitting there. You push power into the fusion part of it. You get it ignited to start producing neutrons. Those neutrons go into the blanket, start breeding fission material, and simultaneously burn it to produce power and it will reach steady state after roughly 123 or 129 days, if I'm not mistaken. And if, if we do all of that, you see that the power flow diagram is something like this. We will have this fusion reactor, which I told you is, is called the gas dynamic mirror. By the way, let me say a few words about that. The gas dynamic mirror, as opposed to the simple mirror that a I mentioned earlier. The simple mirror, which was built at Livermore and was ex experimented with for, I don't know, 20, 30 years before they shut it down, that, that, <clears throat> that mirror was what we call collisionless mirror. What that really means is that these fusion ions, deuterium or tritium ions or what have you, they do travel the system or the, the whole length of the device several times before they undergo a collision. In other words, they have a very long collision mean free path. The gas dynamic mirror, which is the one that I'm, uh, I'm emphasizing here, the plasma will be of such density and temperature as to make this collision mean free path very short compared to the length of the device. What that means is that the plasma behaves like a fluid, like a continuous medium. And so it's governed by different confinement laws than the ones I showed you earlier, okay? In other words, it's just like a gas, and they escape from the mirror, just like a gas coming out of a, uh, out of a tank, okay? And so that, that's a different ball game, entirely different ball game. The major difference being, in the collisionless mirror, so-called, the confinement is basically dependent on the velocity of those particles, in other words, so-called velocity space. In the case of the gas dynamic mirror, there's another element which is absent in the previous one. That is the length, namely the geometry, comes into play. So that the length comes into the picture, and that simply means, which is logical, that if it's long, it takes that gas longer to escape. So the confinement time becomes longer, so it helps, okay? So that's the reason we will go with the gas dynamic mirror as opposed to the so-called collisionless mirror. Now here it is, so the system, the power flow diagram is something like this. Here's the gas dynamic mirror. By the way, we always characterize it by so-called the amplification factor Q. That's, the, that's really the parameter by which we judge all of these fusion devices. What Q means is the ratio of the fusion energy divided by the injection energy, or 
fusion power divided by the injection power. So in order for you to, to sell it to Detroit Edison, you have to have a queue quite large, not one, because one means what I told you before, the break-even condition. Namely, you produce as much energy as you put in. That's not, not, not adequate for a power yet. So Q is an extremely important factor in all the fusion business. For example, the tokamak thing that they're talking about in, in France will have a Q of roughly about four or five, if they ever get to that. That's not really very big. The reason you need large Q values in order to compensate for the inefficiencies of the various components of the power plant, okay? In any case, so we characterize it by Q. Here's the injection power coming in. We have an injector at some efficiency, injects the power into this. You heat the plasma to the proper temperature. You get it ignited. And then, of course, you have something coming out of there. Now, the fusion reaction, like the DT, produces neutrons. That's the name of the game. We're interested in those neutrons for this hybrid reactor. So we want to take those neutrons. You can see them here, PN. They will go into this blanket. Uh, and in that blanket, what do we have? Well, of course, we will have thorium in order to breed uranium-233. Uh, and also, we like to put in a little bit of lithium because tritium is not available. We have to breed tritium. If, it's, if the fusion component uses deuterium, tritium, tritium is not available in nature, so we have to make it. And therefore, we put in lithium because neutrons with lithium produces tritium. We can take that tritium, bring that back to here so that we can inject it back into the system, okay? So we need that. Now, coming back to this blanket, okay, those neutrons will interact with the thorium, produces uranium-233, and of course, that will also, the neutrons will trigger fission reactions in the uranium-233 to, to produce power, okay? To produce power. And you can see that it goes into a thermal converter, and that is converted to some electrical power comes in here. And some of it, will, of course, will bring it back here in order to drive the system. The uh, part of this stuff that comes out of the fusion reactor, which is basically ch charged particles, namely the plasma particles or the alpha particle that is produced in that, that we can recover its energy by means of a direct converter that converts of the, the energy of these charged particles back to electrical power at some efficiency, which is respectable, in the order of about 85% or so. So we can recover some of that energy, turn it into electrical power, and do it this way. Now, you can see this is the gross electric power coming out of the system. Some of it will have to siphon back to drive the system. The remainder is, of course, electrical power, just that that will produce that. And, and I've listed those here for you just to give you some idea. Now, the interesting point is that when we get this fusion reactor going, Remember, we set it there, we put in power in it, we ignited it, it started to produce neutrons, and we reached steady state, and that's what's going on. The question always comes up is that how much of this power that you have to siphon back to keep the fusion component going? Well, from our calculation, we show it's actually not very large. It turns out that roughly about 2% of the net electric power coming out of here, all you need is to drive that. So that's a profitable business, okay? So on the whole, you can produce enormous amount of power very efficiently by this hybrid system. Now, to give you some numbers, it would be useful to say, and I did not put it here for you. Our calculation shows that if I take a system such as this hybrid reactor made out of this, the fusion component being the mag magnetic mirror, and even though there's some end losses, but we'll catch some of those end losses over here and recover their energy. That, if we take that system using this gas dynamic mirror, which has certain laws that you have to obey, it turns out we, this system, power system, we can produce in the blanket, namely this, on the order of about nine and a half gigawatts of power per unit length. That's an enormous amount of power. Now, if you take that power, and thermally converted to electrical power, you're generating an enormous amount of power in the terawatts of power. Okay, that's, that's really the, the, the idea behind it. Uh, we haven't done all of the detailed calculation, but the approximate thing that we obtain by having a fusion component here like the mirror, 
whereby we put in densities on the order of about 10, 15, or 10 to the 16 particles per cubic centimeter. That's quite a bit. And of course, that requires a very large magnetic field to confine it, right? But that's all right. That's sitting on Earth, so we're not worried too much about the mass. That is doable. And then we can produce neutron fluxes, like the picture I showed you before. We can produce neutron fluxes that are on the order of uh, 10 to the 16 neutrons per cubic centimeter per second, all right, coming in from the fusion plasma to the blanket to initiate. In other words, these are the parameters that I'm talking about. Typically, the length of this plasma will be on the order of about four meters, okay? That's not very big. The density of the plasma here is on the order of about 10 to the 16 particles per cubic centimeter which requires a sizable magnetic field to confine it. Well, that's OK. And then, it, uh, the, then that, that neutron flux goes into this blanket. And the neutrons, because they are high energy neutrons, so-called fast neutrons, 14 MeV neutrons, they're high energy. The target being thorium is a high mass number. So those neutrons don't lose very much energy as, as they collide with the target. They simply diffuse, and you take that into account so that you can make a calculation by which you insist that the neutrons die out at the edge of the blanket, namely that the flux will die out at that point. So you can calculate the whole distribution of the neutrons in that region, and from that, you can calculate the amount of power you produce because it depends on the neutron density, on the uranium density, which, by the way, that uranium density using the, the, the thorium blanket in the, in the steady state operation turns out to be one-tenth of the density of the thorium. In fact, that's exactly the same number that Rubio did in his, in his uh, accelerator system. In other words, the number of uranium-233, or the number density, that is created in here in steady state is always one-tenth of the thorium density. Okay? So you take that into account, knowing that density, knowing the, the uh, cross-sections, which is the, the probability of, of, of fission reactions, you can calculate the power. And then we calculated that, and we show that on the, on the order of about nine, nine and a half gigawatt of power per unit length, you can produce. Now, that's a little bit on the high side, because we did not take into account the fact that you have to cool the system. You have to extract the energy. How do you do that? Well, you have to put in ducts in here or here in order to put in coolant, whether it's water or helium or what have you. And that's on the order of about 70, I mean 30% of that. So if you take 70% of that, you can still get on the order of about uh, six, seven gigawatts per centimeter. And for the length that I'm talking about, which is four meters, you can see that's an enormous amount of power you can produce. So to sort of summarize by saying is that this is an approach whereby you can produce enormous amounts of power that will certainly <coughs> satisfy the needs of the whole world for that matter if it's 60 or 30 to 60, 600 terawatt. You can do that with this approach. There's quite a bit yet to be done. I'm not going to try and make it you know, sound as easy as it is. There's still some work to be done, particularly in, in the plasma area, even though this fusion plasma is reasonably well behaved. There are still some things that are still have to be addressed. But by and large, it is not insurmountable, and I think it can be done. So that we can, with, with, with effort, with money, and all that, we should be able to build a hybrid reactor with a fusion component, which we call the gas dynamic mirror, surrounded by a thorium blanket, which will produce an enormous amounts of power safely, safely in the sense in the following sense, for those of you who may be familiar with reactor physics, the so-called multiplication factor, namely the number of neutrons produced per fission in the blanket, the K, they call K effective or the multiplication, it's less than one, which means it is subcritical, not like all the reactors we operate now, which are all critical. This will be subcritical, so it's safe. It doesn't, you know. It's not, it doesn't go critical or belt or something. It would be subcritical, number one. Number two, it's secure because this is a non-proliferation resistant thorium cycle. That it's, it's very resistant to clandestine operations and what have you. So in fact, 
The weapons people don't fool around with uranium-233. They don't even use it for that because it's nasty to deal with. So anybody who thinks he can handle that is, 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 is putting his life at risk. So it is resistant to that. So it does have that in it. And it can produce the kind of power that, as I said, enormous amount of power that indeed can meet the, the, uh, the world's need. Now, let me put one other thing here since I mentioned it to some of the colleagues here. Uh, next week, I am going to a meeting called the Advanced Space Propulsion Workshop in which a bunch of people talk about some futuristic schemes for space propulsion. So this is a schematic of what I would consider a, a fusion hybrid, fission fusion hybrid propulsion system. You can see basically you will have a plasma in here, just like the picture I showed you before. The neutrons go into the blanket, they start producing fission. Then we will have these propellant flow, well, in the case of a reactor on Earth, will be coolant, and here will be typically like helium. So in principle, that this power produced here can be extracted by the helium, and you can drag it down to some nozzle and eject it to give you thrust. Now, I calculated just roughly some numbers here to show what the characteristics of such a system is. The propulsion system is usually characterized by two important parameters. One is called the specific impulse, which is basically the velocity of the exhaust, okay, divided by, by g in this case. Specific impulse has a dimension of seconds. And as, for example, the rockets that we shoot in, in space nowadays, which are chemical, have a specific impulse of 450 seconds. A nuclear thermal propulsion, like the people in Cleveland are working on, will have 900 seconds. This will have 10,000 seconds of specific impulse. The higher the specific impulse, the quicker you're going to get there, and the less fuel you use, obviously. And the other one is the thrust. Using the amount of flow, flow, uh, the flow here, the mass flow rate, at the velocity we're talking about, we can produce on the order of about, in this case, about 29 mega newtons or 29 million newtons, which is a very high thrust. So in principle, if you ever get to that point, that could give you a propulsion uh, capability that can open up solar system readily. In fact, I use a rough calculation using this kind of a thing, say, to go to Mars, calculating or estimating the mass of the system, and it can take about roughly 23 days round trip to Mars if you use the system. So it does have a potential of going there rather quickly. So let me now summarize what I said, and uh, uh, I think it's about the right time. So here is my conclusions, which um, I hope you can see that. OK, I say here that the fusion, the fusion hybrid reactor produced large amounts of nuclear power that can indeed meet the global energy needs by of the near future. It breeds its own fuel. That's the other advantage. In other words, we run out of the mined uranium, so we make it. We breed it here. So you breed your own fuel. And that's the other advantage for the rocket, by the way. The, the, the people who are working on what we call nuclear thermal propulsion, you have to have a reactor that will go critical in space. Okay, so you have to supply that, put it in space. This Hybrid, it makes its own fuel as it goes along, as I showed you. It breeds the fissile material and simultaneously burn it to produce power. So the thorium fuel cycle, as I said, of special interest because it's inherent, it has inherent security advantage. Handling U-233 is very dangerous. It requires a amount of shielding and remote handling. In fact, one of the things is that the uranium-233 usually has about U-232 in it, a little bit of that. And the decay product of the U-232 is thallium, and that is an immensely dangerous isotope. It emits like a, a, a very energetic gamma ray. I mean, it's very, very serious and dangerous. So people better not fool around with that. Uh, the fusion component of this serves primarily as a neutron source, so therefore it's more readily achievable. In other words, as opposed to the pure fusion power. The reason is what I called a little while ago, this n-tau business. 
M tau 10 to the 14 is break even, okay? That means you get as much energy as you put in it. That's all you need, or even less than that, for this, because all you're worried about is getting enough neutrons to get into the blanket. You're not worried about producing power, even though you get some power on the side because you are burning plasma. But the main thrust or the main purpose of the fusion component is simply to supply neutrons that will go into the blanket to breed fissile material and also simultaneously burn it to produce power. So that's the beauty of it. Okay, now the gas dynamic mirror, I mentioned that because I think that is very ideally suited for that. It's having a tough time getting this thing right. <laughs> okay. The, uh, <clears throat> the gas dynamic mirror, as I said, as opposed to the so-called collisionless mirror, is very very interesting and useful, ideally suited for that, because one, it's simple, linear, axisymmetric, nice, we like that, and uh, it can have high mirror ratio so that it contain the plasma long enough to do the job, and its physics is reasonably, I say reasonably well understood. There's still a little bit of work to be done in that, but it's by and large fairly well understood. So in other words, we can, we can predict its performance reasonably well as a event. And then the control of the reactor, hybrid reactor, of course you do that by controlling the neutron source. You manipulate the magnetic field, you can change the containment or the confinement of the plasma, therefore you can control the neutrons going into the system. So that's sort of an indirect way. In the, in the regular reactors we have control rods. In this case you don't need that, all you need is basically control the neutrons coming out of the fusion reactor. <clears throat> Okay, and uh, let me continue here. I'm just getting to, towards the end. Okay, and as I said, the, the neutrons will impinge on the, on the, on the uh, blanket and it produces, as I said, breed and uh, produce power. The hybrid reactor is safe. I say it's safe because it, the so-called multiplication factor is less than one. It is subcritical, that's extremely important. Now, we always worry about critical system because some perturbation may make them go super critical and leads to melting or whatever. This one is subcritical, it's just well behaved. It does not go prompt critical at all because the so-called multiplication factor is less than one. What that really means is that the fission reactions that take place in the blanket produce enough neutrons, but not enough to make it go critical. In other words, we rely on the neutrons coming from the fusion reactor to supplement that. So by and large, this will always be subcritical, and that makes it safe. Okay, and then the hybrid reactors, I said, produce power. Uh, yeah, I, did, I should have mentioned this, that you know, in the way of producing this, we still have a materials problem, like any fusion system. After all, the, 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 the chamber in which we have the plasma will be facing a high fluxes of, of uh, neutrons and other you know, radiation, charged particles, what have you. So we have to develop the materials that will withstand all of that. And so that's another issue that has to be done. Whether you go for fusion power or hybrid, you really have to deal with the uh, materials problem. And as I noted in the power flow diagram, it's a small fraction, a small fraction of that power that's produced will be needed to keep the fusion thing going, which is very important. In other words, the worry is, or is it, are we gonna, most of that power go back just to keep the fusion component? The answer is no. We produce a lot of power and a very small fraction is required to keep the, to sustain the fusion reaction. And as I said, it lends itself to other systems. In other words, we really, some people have been looking at this because you can use other, if you don't want to use thorium, you can burn something else. You can, be, you can burn the spent fuel from regular reactors so you alleviate the problem, the radioactive waste disposal problem. And in there you could burn, because of the fast neutrons, you can burn a lot of the so-called minor actinide. It's burned on the spot. And other isotopes can be transmuted to a much lower lifetime. So the, the, the whole question of radioactive waste disposal problem is extremely alleviated by the use of the hybrid reactor. Whether you burn these things or in the case of creating them in the system and burning them in situ. And so as I said here, you can burn these minor actinides 
right on the spot. And I think one last item here. One last item is this. So the hybrids, oh, I should mention that that's very interesting too. The hybrids basically extract almost 100% of the energy available in the fuel as compared, for example, to the light water reactors that we have built all over the place. The energy extraction out of those are on the order of a few percent, whereas in this case, you almost extract all of the energy in the fuel. Just the system lends itself to that very easily. OK, I think one last item I would like to uh, add to your interest. I, I put some interesting facts here, because we're always concerned about how much energy are we consuming, to what extent. <coughs> Here's some interesting facts. The United States consumes, you can see if you can count that number, about 4 million da, 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 of gigawatt hours of electric power in the year 2000. So I forgot, what is it, 2000? And, um, and, and that, this is in 2008, I think. So you can see, and 71% of that is from fossil fuel, which we don't like. We want carbon-free power. When, that's why the hybrid will be a very useful approach. So about 71% of that is from fossil fuel emitting how much? Well, 2.4 times 10 to the 9 metric tons of carbon dioxide. Now that's polluting the system, all right. The remaining 19% is are from nuclear power. So it's roughly in the United States, we have 20% of our power comes from nuclear reactors almost 80 or 70 some percent of it comes from fossil fuel. Now, if you take that, this is equivalent to alleviating the system of that much of carbon dioxide by going to the nuclear power. Currently, we have 104 reactors in the US, and four are being planned to be built in the near future, as far as I know. And the economics of part is always the argument of that, that I don't know much about that myself, but there's all sorts of people who have been arguing that. And there was a publication which shows that basically nuclear power, the cost of megawatt hour of nuclear power is by far better than any of the so-called fossil or the renewable, because they keep talking about renewable. I don't know what it is, wind and solar or what have you, that's much less. So, in totality, the cost of the fuel is, even though it's a very small fraction of the overall cost, and it does fluctuate with that, we don't have to do that issue at all in the case of the hybrid reactor. Well, I think with this much, I would like to conclude my talk and to say that we really should take seriously the question of building hybrid reactors, and I Obviously, I'm biased. I'm in favor of simple steady-state systems as opposed to what the Livermore people are talking about, 192 beams, pulse systems, and what have you. I think it's doable. The fusion component is more readily achievable because we are not looking for pure fusion power. In other words, we need to operate at a so-called break-even or less, which is much more readily achievable uh, in, 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 in an experiment or in, in an actual device than, than a fusion, pure fusion power. And so uh, it does have all the characteristics that lend itself to production of lots of power safely and securely. And with that, I think I'll, I'll close up. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lewis Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program.